Good afternoon and welcome to today's Packets Facts webcast on the U.S. Pet Market Outlook. I'm Joe Tarnowski, Vice President of Content for ECRM, and I'll be the moderator for today's presentation. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, for a better viewing experience, we recommend using the webcast window in full screen mode. As this is an interactive webcast, there will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. You can post your questions using the dashboard at any time during the webcast, and they'll be answered by our presenter during the Q&A. If we happen to run out of time before we get to all the questions live, we'll do our best to answer them via email. Finally, if you miss any portion of the presentation, you can view the on-demand version at packagefacts.com and on ECRM's uh, content gateway. We'll also send you a link to the on-demand version of the webcast following the event. Now, let's get started. We're all familiar with the concept of humanization of pets, but I think by now the transformation is complete, and they are, in fact, one of us. They're eating human-grade food, they're wearing stylish apparel, staying with us at hotels, visiting salons, and having prescriptions filled for them. In fact, a quick look at Facebook and you'll see just as many posts of people's pets as there are of their kids, if not more. At ECRM's pet planning session meetings held earlier this, last month, this was especially evident in the products that suppliers were highlighting. There were birthday cakes for dogs, blood glucose monitors for pets, pet bedding that looked more comfortable than my own, and even dog beer. Yep, dog beer. Our presenter today is David Sprinkle, Research Director for Package Facts, and he's going to discuss the powerful role of this human-animal bond and how it's impacting consumer spending on pet products. Among the items he'll cover are pet owner demographic trends, the impact of local, eco-friendly, and global consciousness on the pet market, and new product opportunity areas, including novel pet food ingredients and exotic proteins, pet wellness, and pet cleanup. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, David Sprinkle. Dave, take it away. Okay, thank you, Joe. Um, welcome to our guests from ECRM, also our guests from the Pet Industry Distributor Association, and also our own subscribers to our Package Facts Pet Industry Knowledge Center. I want to talk today about the pet market outlook in a few specific terms. Um, first, I want to look at um, pet owner demographics and pet ownership rates. Then I want to um, go from that to looking at millennials and the, um, the role of millennials in defining the direction of the market, both in terms of their use of tech and also their distinctive attitudes towards food and pet food. And then I'll wrap up with the two, a few top line comments looking ahead some growth projections, top line, and some conclusions. So to jump right into pet owner ownership rates, these are some data from the Simmons Market Research. This is a huge national database. They've been around for decades, I think since, since the middle last century, and each of the surveys represented here has a sample of about 25,000, and it's a very scientific random sample. So with that in mind, looking at the household ownership rates for dogs and cats, the percent of U.S. households who own dog and cat, that has grown from, um, in the case of dogs, from 35% in 2006 to um, nearly around 40% in, 2000, in 2015. And this has been a steady climb in ownership rates. For cats, in, in contrast, Ownership rates have held their own at around a quarter of households. And while the most recent year shows a little bit of jump, it's basically been steady and holding its own. We'll have to see in the future whether that jump showing for 215 will hold in the future. But in terms of pet ownership rates, the star of the show have definitely been dogs. And it's not just in terms of dogs versus cats, it's also in terms of all the other types of pets for which, as you can see here, household ownership rates have declined. So not only are they a fraction of the ownership rates that we have for dogs, but they're in decline. 
the, and that includes um, your traditional sort of other pets, such as fish and birds, but also your, your more exotic and specialty pets. Reptiles, for example, had a moment in the sun a few years ago, but that's not holding up. And overall, it is the dogs who are the star of the show. So much so that it really has meant a change in what you know in who's occupying the American home, and um, who we think of as members of the family, as Joe was talking about. So some stats here in terms of owning dogs, having dogs in the home, and having children in the home. So not you know decades ago, pets, dogs were thought of as nice to have for children to a large degree. By 2014, it was beginning to sort of break even, and 33% of households had dogs, 36% had children, and that's children under 18 in the household, right? Not adult children, not offspring. But by 2015, with the demographic um, changes and, and the pet ownership trends that we just looked at, 41% of households have dogs versus only 32% have children in the household. And every year we update this, and every year the percentage owning dogs is higher, and the percentage with children in the household is lower. And so we get to, to sort of the world that we have now, where um, at least on a tongue-in-cheek basis, or presumably tongue-in-cheek, we get slogans and bumper stickers like, pets welcome, children must be leased, or my dog is smarter than your honor student. And actually that photo is off the Washington Post style section today where the star of the Cannes Film Festival is French, the French bulldog of Carrie Fisher of Star Wars fame, who um, really has basically stolen the show even at Cannes. And that really speaks to this new role that we have for pets and especially dogs in, in our homes, in, in our hearts. The, um, and if, if, you, if you're following pet market research, the one word you'll hear most is humanization, right? Humanization of pet products, humanization of pet services. That is in, intertwined with really what we can call the dogification of the, of the pet market. Because dogs are um, the most childlike of pets in many ways. So the dogification of the market is really what's led to this human, humanization of the pet market in terms of the products and services offered. With this change in dog ownership rates, it's been across the board, as you can see with the data here by generation. For the millennials, 18 to 34. For Gen X, 18 to, uh, 35 to 49. For boomers, 50 to 69. And for the older seniors. The big jump, though, and really the phenomenal jump, is in the millennials. This is the 18 to 34-year-old bracket. So in 2005, rounding up, 34% of, um, of 18 to 34 year olds had a dog. That jumped to 47% by 2015. This is again an incredible change in dog ownership rates for this younger adult age bracket. And what is driving that increased um, ownership rate for dogs and really the growth in the pet market that has attracted so much attention for marketers and retailers and even the investment community. And we can see that the, the ownership rates have jumped across the board, but it's especially true for that 18 to 34 year old um, subset of the consumers. And just as a, as a quick example of where that's changing the demographics of pet product buyers, look at the data toward the bottom of the slide on the share of dog toy purchasers by age bracket. And you can see that as recently as 2011, the, 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 the sort of the, the share of purchasers was fairly evenly broken out um, across the age 25 and 34 bracket all the way to 55 to 64. But even by 2015, just four years later, with millennials coming into the market and um, owning dogs in particular at such high rates, they account fully for a quarter of dog toy purchasers. And as you can see, you get a less even distribution across those middle adult brackets. And that's true across the board in terms of pet product purchasing with the size of the millennial generation and also really their, 
the propensity for dog ownership. The, um, the question, one of the big questions in the pet, pet market for, for really the last decade has been whether boomers, of course your other big bald generation, would keep owning pets into their senior years. Because if they did it, that would be a significant plunge for um, pet market revenues and profits. As it turns out, and we, and we saw this earlier with dogs, boomers are holding on or staying on as pet owners longer than is traditional. So that was good news. What was even better news, though, and almost sort of made it a moot question, was the degree to which millennials jumped in as pet owners and, again, particularly as dog owners. So you can see from this chart that pet ownership rates stay right around two-thirds of households all the way through age 60 and really stay very strong um, at least to at least half all the way till 70. So the, um, the boomers and between the boomers and the millennials, we really have very healthy pet ownership rates all the way into your very senior years. The looking at the millennials and their role in the, in the pet market, I want to look at millennials and how they're distinctive as consumers overall initially. So stepping back from the pet market just to just looking at millennials and what they are like, how they are distinctive. To do that, I want to go back to the Simmons survey. And what I did was I gathered a set of over 400 psychographic questions. These are attitude and behavior questions. And um, they, 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 they're general questions. They're not necessarily uh, product category specific. But you can, see the, um, you can see the range of topics here, what Simmons calls general, self-concepts, diet and health, food, travel, internet and media, cell phones, tech, health and medicine, finance, shopping. Because what I wanted to see is how millennials are distinctive compared to 18 to 34-year-olds um, um, in the past. And what I used was the year 2009. So again, just to give you a quick sense of the range of kind of, of psychographics, of attitudes and opinions that are that is being tested here. A store's environment can make a difference. A woman's place is in the home. Advertising is a waste of, of time. This is whether you consider yourself affectionate, passionate, loving, romantic. All products that pollute the environment should be banned. Um, taking medication, coupons, um, you know, meal times, breakfast. Cable TV, children, child raising, computers, fast food, financial security, a whole range of questions. And looking specifically at the percent of 18 to 34 year olds who agreed with these statements in 2009 versus now in 2015. So making this comparison to get at how millennials are distinctive. And you can see from this top 20 slide, these are the top 20 psychographics of over 400 in which the change of the percentage of 18 to 34 year olds between 2009 and 2015 really jumped up. The question here, how many of these major most significant changes involve tech of the top 20? All of them. All of the top 20 ch changes are about, about tech. So you can see the jump, for example, from 15% of 18 to 34 year olds in 2009 to 45% in 2015 for rely on my cell phone to keep up with news or sports. Use my cell phone in many different ways. Use information from my cell phone to decide you know, where, where to go or what to do in free time. Um, the extra features of my cell phone are more important than traditional calling features. And on and on to relationships with families, to relationships with friends, all kinds of different areas are affected most significantly by tech and especially by cell phone, but also, of course, by the Internet. Now, if we look at the next set of 20, where there's that biggest change um, between now versus 2009, again, many of these, of these areas of change, the ones marked in blue, are again, um, are again tech. For example, that first one, texting is just as meaningful to me as an actual conversation with a person on the phone. Something that's a little bit scary to those of us in older generations. But the other subset where you start seeing important changes in attitudes are those marked in green are about food. So we see salted snacks are my favorite snack. 
Um, most, most frozen food, frozen dinners have little nutritional value. Again, they're agreeing with this. Usually only snack on healthy foods. When shopping for food, I especially look for organic or natural foods. And also the kitchen is the most important room um, in my home. And even, of course, these, these are primarily about health food, about natural eating. And even something like salty snacks are my favorite snack that also ties in with, say, nuts and seeds as snacks as opposed to candy. So there's also a health dimension to that. So tech and especially smartphones are by far the major driver or the major enabler of these changing attitudes and behaviors. Number two you can see is this some new attitudes for food. Um, even though I won't go into it as much, another area that starts kicking in is ecological and sustainability issues. So if you look at that second question, or that second statement, people have a responsibility to use recycled products whenever possible. The percentage agreeing that even over the relatively short span of 2009-2015 jumped from 47 percent rounding off to 56 percent. The okay, so if tech um, is intimately associated with the most dramatic changes in these attitudes and behaviors, how can we see that now back in the tech market? So if we look at the, um, at the most recent purchase of pet products online, this is from some of our own survey data, you can see that the percentage who have made an um, online purchase of pet products in the last seven days jumped from 16% in 2012, not that long ago, to 27% in 2015. And you can see that these, um, the, the percentages for these more frequent or more recent purchasers purchases are going up, while the percentages for the less frequent purchases are actually down. So the percentage who haven't who haven't bought the percentage of pet owners who haven't bought a pet product online in the last 12 months is going down, um, and that's even true for within the last six months. The um, Amazon is a huge has a play, uh, huge role in this, including in the increasingly popular delivery home delivery of pet food, which of course has major implications for retailing of, of pet products because pet food um, comprises the, the lion's share of expenditures and of purchase occasions. And um, it would be difficult to exaggerate the importance of Amazon and Amazon Prime in this process. But you can see here some stats on, um, of, of um, buying products through Amazon for pet owners versus U.S. adults overall for being a member of Amazon Prime, which of course makes it especially likely that you will purchase frequently, and even buying food and beverage products through Amazon. The numbers here are really relatively low percent, low 11 percent, 13 percent, but um, even this, this survey I believe was early 2015, Amazon has really ramped up its fresh food delivery um, since that time. And I live in the Baltimore area where I live you can get an Amazon delivery within two hours, right, with Amazon Now. So this is not only sort of a, um, a giant in the industry, but a giant that keeps growing. Um, and especially in terms of home delivery of pet food, especially, especially for your urban consumers, you can see high rates of having um, pet food delivered to your home. And this has tremendous implications because this means for retailers and also for marketers, because you're not in the store aisles looking for pet food. And that especially has implications for more impulse categories, such as pet treats, for example, unless they're tied in somehow to the pet food regimen or for toys. So again, this is a major, I wouldn't say disruptor, but certainly a major force in the marketplace. The, in terms of use, using the inter, internet and smartphones, mobile technology for pet products in the last 30 days, you can see how common it is and for what a, a variety of reasons to research um, products, to compare prices, to look for promotions and sales, look for coupons, to buy products, to compare products and so forth. And um, even, even for your less frequent sort of medium for this, your smartphones and tablets, you're still seeing some pretty strong numbers. So you can really see here the degree to which digital media, this consumer-facing technology, is really changing the way we, um, we um, search for pet products, 
search for pet product pricing and, and bargains, and even buy pet products. The, it also really changes the way we interact with our pets and uh, monitor their health and well-being. So of our own survey of data here on um, the way you use media to track your dog's activities. And you can see here, I won't go over all these numbers, you will have the deck available to you after the webinar, so um, you'll be able to see those numbers at your own leisure. But you can see that these are really high numbers and that often, especially for your more specialized forms of monitoring your dog's activity and well-being and health, the millennials are doing it at an even higher rates than, um, than, than, your, than your older consumers or than adults overall. So for webcam, for smartphones and tablets, for collars with tracking devices, you can see how millennials are doing this um, even more than U.S. pet owners overall, even though the overall rates are pretty robust in themselves. You can also see when you look at the use of maps for sort of pet-related purchases, again, very, you know, relatively high rates here, robust rates across a variety of purposes. And also when we ask, would you like to use these in the future, um, even higher percentage than those who have used. So um, nearly a quarter have, have used uh, mobile apps to receive digital coupons. Over a third would like to in the future. So there's definitely growth in the use, use of mobile apps for these, um, for these pet product purchasing um, and even um, other and delivery, other types of services, the way there is for consumer apps overall. When thinking of pet products and technology, um, you can see the way that, that they're transforming the market and raising new possibilities. So say, for example, we have a litter-made automatic litter box here, which of course automates the process, makes it uh, more convenient, less messy, but is also now, for example, designed to go with a more natural cat litter, a uh, corn fiber-based litter. So you're not only getting sort of the, the technology, the automation, you're also, being, you're also able to incorporate sort of that eco-conscious shopping if you go that route. That's also true with your um, Nature's Miracle with their automatic litter box and their um, natural cat litter that goes, that goes with that. And you start getting into where you really are providing a solution or a service for pet owners. So say with Nature's Miracle, it's not just a litter box, it's not just cat litter, it's also an odor control litter system. And with the automatic litter box here from our pets, that also um, has a Bluetooth function attached. And so you can monitor your cat's use of the litter box. And certainly if there's any disruption of the cat's routine, and if you're, if, you know, if you're away at work or you're away for a short trip, you can monitor sort of the, the continued function of your cat and well-being of your cat through this kind of technology. And we expect to see more and more of this um, in, in the pet durables market. And I think for the market overall, it makes a lot of sense to rethink pet product categories as also providing a very specific solution and service that helps it to stand out from competitors. And so looking at these images, one, we have um, now very fashionable, especially urban areas, is your fresh meal kit delivery. Uh, for example, Blue Apron. So we have that now for dogs, for pets. Uh, people have been talking about meal solutions for in the grocery industry for decades. Meal solutions is now a relevant term for our pets. And you have not simply, say, a, a bowl for your dog food for your people. You have an automatic feeder. And not only is it an automatic feeder, but it also has portion control. And so it can provide sort of a weight management service in relation to feeding your your dog, your cat, in addition to ensuring this constant supply or this, this steady supply of pet food. You also have pet treats that, that provide dental health, oral care, oral hygiene. You have um, watering um, bowl, water bowls that are also a, a fountain that provide, help provide fresh aerated water for your dog or cat. You have grooming tools that help sort of um, preventatively um, um, sort of stave off problems with shedding. So you, you have de-shedders that help avoid that problem before it, it's all over your household. You have um, flea, flea and tick collars that also provide a calming, a calming function, 
again, pro providing this extra service in addition to its immediate function. Or, for example, you have this um, very upscale um, cat perch that, um, in, a, in a way, is sort of a gym membership for your cat, right? If you have enough imagination, it's a personal trainer for your cat. So it really is providing a service, a solution um, to a problem, to a concern, above and beyond the way that we have usually been thinking in terms of these pet categories, food and non-food. Looking also at that, um, at that cat stand, cat perch, you can also see that we really increasingly expect for our pets the same kind of quality, the same kind of standards, um, even including design standards that we expect for ourselves. We can really see that we get to pested most directly and most, um, um, and most explicitly. And so in the pet food aisles, you'll see all the dynamics going on in the human food market. The emphasis on fresh, the emphasis on superfood ingredients uh, such as kale, the emphasis on real foods, on whole foods, on high quality natural ingredients, on knowing what those ingredients are. You can see in this true food, um, pet food, you can see it's whole food baked in small batches, baked in distinction to extrusion, so you have lower temperatures, um, ideally more preservation of nutrition. You can see that small batches, again, also a term from the, for the human food industry, the idea of crafted art, artisanal food products. You can see with the Purina quality, the Purina product beyond, you can see the grain-free. Again, this is, ties into the low-carb and grain-free concerns of many human consumers. You can see um, this, is a, this is a white fish and egg recipe. That egg actually reflects or the recent rehabilitation of egg as a high-quality protein source with the diminished and even perhaps now um, um, vanquished concern over cholesterol. You can see with the crafted pet food, you can even see with the um, blue buffalo product, even going on human, not only the quality of ingredients, but even human cooking concepts such as chicken pot pie. You'll see also a lot of stews, other sort of culinary, sort of culinary approaches directly from the kitchen, directly from the cookbook being applied um, to pets. If you look at the claims that pet foods are making, the marketing claims, this is some of our own survey data comparing dog owners versus cat owners by the percentage who buy a pet food making these claims. You can see top is actually made in the USA. And you'll see that actually in many of the products, including the, the samples we just saw, that actually really ties into concerns over pet food and pet treat safety. Um, there was, there was, there was a, been really a string of recalls and problems to, since 2007. Um, it really continues to some degree to today and mostly associated with imports, whether products or ingredients from, from China. So because of that, Made in the USA is one of the most powerful claims in the market and that corresponds to product safety. But looking past that, at these additional sort of top concerns, natural, grain-free, gluten-free, non-GMO, organic, even locally sourced, um, ancestral, paleo, these are all really torn from the pages of the human food market, right? These are the same concerns transferring over to our pet food. And what's driving really um, increasing consciousness of, of how our pet foods are formulated, an inc uh, increasing attention to what's in and what's not in there, and really increased price points for pet foods overall. In the specialty market, um, certainly, but in the, in the mass market also. So even in the mass market of, um, of, of discount stores like Walmart or Target or supermarkets or drug stores, even there, the, the, the brand or the brand lines that are claiming sales growth are your premium brand lines, if not super premium. We can see some of these human concerns transferring over to the pet market, for example, or the paleo or wilderness um, um, trend with dog and cat food. Again, this is straight from the paleo diet, the idea that we should eat more like cavemen, to have wasteland, wastelines more like, cave, like cavemen, cave women. So you can see here, this is some data from GFK, um, pet specialty sales for pet food meal, 
for some of your more exotic meats, your wilderness meats that are um, popular now in pet food formulation. And you can see really very robust um, um, sales growth percentages here for pet food formulations with bison or buffalo at 6%, for duck at 9%, for salmon at 14%. All of these animals, all the fowl, game bird, or fish that have these sort of wilderness hunting association. It's also rabbit, it's also um, venison, even goat. Anything that's not associated with domesticated farm animals and sort of big food, and sort of your big food industrial processing. So in this Nature's Valley Instinct formula here, you can see this, this cat, you know, um, striding in the more or less wilderness like a big cat would do. So there's a sense that, you know, these, these are our kittens are, um, you know, they come from the wild, they should eat like they, they come from the wild with sort of a hunting meat such as rabbit. This is indicative, again, of rethinking what we're doing with pets and in following all these concerns from the human food market. We can see that all, not only in the formulations of pet food and how they're changing, but also even in the format. So we have frozen and refrigerated pet food with visible inclusions of sort of human food like vegetables. We have freeze-dried, an important freeze-dried and raw trend because freeze-dried help preserve the natural nutrition of these formulations. And we have also dehydrated other, other new alternative formats that, um, that, uh, that attempt in different ways to give us a better quality formulation, better natural nutrition for our pet food. And it is all essentially about natural nutrition, which we associate with health. So um, what, again, one of our own um, survey questions here, I place a high priority on buying pet foods with natural ingredients. 25% um, strongly agree, you know, motivating their behavior. 29% at least somewhat agree. A significant percentage also are sort of middle of the road, but look at how few somewhat disagree or strongly um, that should be disagree with that compared to the percentage who strongly or somewhat agree. Um, a major driver in the market, and again, expecting for our pets exactly the kinds of things that we want for ourselves. And this all ties into well-being, to healthcare. When we ask whether you agree that high-quality pet foods are effective in preventative health care, you can see again high numbers for dog owners and cat owners not only that, but the numbers jumping up, say among dog owners, 18% strongly agreed with that claim in 2014, jumping to 37% in 2016. And also, as importantly, look at how few actually disagree with this statement. So a very clear um, tilt, a very clear slant to the landscape there. So looking ahead on how this all adds up for the pet market. One point is that you have to make is that pet owners, um, as is consistent with the recent recession, continue to look for value, but not in the sense of the lowest price item, the cheapest item, but in the sense of really good prices, really good values for the best products. So uh, we can see here some of our own data among pet owners who actually are somewhat more affluent than adults overall, still. 34% strongly agree that they're looking out for lower prices, special offers, and sales, and 37% somewhat agree. Um, look, again, in contrast at the very low percentages who disagree at either level with this. So it is true that your pet product shopper, shoppers, even if they want organic venison as the, the meat for their pet food, they're still looking for good prices. The um, if we look at the question, I'm spending less on pet products because of the economy, again, not necessarily great news here, although things are getting better. And we can see that as of 2013, we can at least say that the plurality, the highest percentage, at least neither agree nor disagree. So at least they aren't being sort of drugged down, dragged down in their pet product purchasing by economic concerns. And we can see that Whereas in 2011, the 22% um, at least somewhat agreed that they're spending less on pet products because of the economy. But as of 2015, 
sort of the tide had shifted, and now the higher percentage somewhat disagrees that they're spending less, which is, of course, what you want as a marketer and retailer of pet products. The same kind of pattern is evident if we look at the change in financial situation among pet owners. And you can see here the majority define themselves as about the same, the, pro, the plurality, I should say, from 2012 to 2015. But there has been a shift in tide where your sort of second highest share has gone from somewhat worse off to somewhat better off in 2015. So again, not a um, huge cause for celebration, but at least a, a gradual movement in the right direction. And what's especially port important here, as we can see from this um, graph of, of um, the percentage of consumers who are highly confident, the millennials are especially likely to be highly, highly confident as consumers and therefore to, to spend more. And as millennials both enter the pet market in droves and set the tone for the pet market, that's good news. You can see that this, there is this sort of gradually positive tone to the market and to market growth also on these data on channel shopping for pet products. And so these data show the percentage of pet, pet owning households who shop in these different major channels. And you can see that the percentage is actually gradually increasing for pet superstores and it's gradually decreasing for discount stores such as Walmart and Target. This speaks to the premiumization of the market. Now to be fair, some of this is because some consumers are going to even deeper discount channels like dollar stores. But overall, it's especially channels, especially products that have the momentum in the market, especially for growth. And this is consistent, again, with the humanization of pets, especially, um, especially of dogs, and of wanting for our pets, for our dogs, for our cats, exactly the kinds of things that we want for ourselves. Because of that, these are some of our market projections for the overall pet products and services. And you can see that we see the, the overall market, which is already huge, really gradually ratcheting up in annual growth, consistent with its premiumization, consistent, consistent with wanting products that, that incorporate our own values, our own expectations for standards, and including, again, let me emphasize, even design standards. And so the, in conclusion, the drivers for growth in the market are going to be this premiumizing of pet products that ties into the humanization of pets, and especially the dogification of the market, and really this growing concern and attention to um, the health, the wellness, and even really the, raw, the broader well-being of the market. And especially in the case of millennials, they, they expect and demand products that meet their expectations, that reflect their values, including with, with, um, with touches like free-range chicken or natural materials in their bedding. And they have little patience or time for any marketers, any retailers who are not attending to, to that drive. With that, let me wrap up the main presentation and turn it over to Joe to lead the question and answer session. Okay, thanks Dave for uh, a great presentation. And uh, just a quick note, I wanted to let all of the attendees know we realized a couple of slides were cut off at the bottom. So we're going to make sure that all of the slides are available to you post event. Uh, we do have a few questions here in the queue, so uh, we'll get started right at the top. Um, do you, well first, before I get to this question, can you define natural uh, as opposed to organic in uh, how you represent it in your data? Um, a lot of this data is consumer survey data. So it means whatever consumers think it means, which is a good thing because there's really, there's no, there's no way to define natural. Certainly the um, government doesn't yet define it the way, of course, organic is defined. But even with that sort of um, um, sli slightly wimpy answer, in, in general it means the use of natural ingredients and the absence of artificial ingredients. It can also mean, for example, a, um, a sustainability being incorporated in. It can mean use of, of fewer materials and less processed materials. So the, the same kind of things that we think of in terms of the human market also apply in the pet, in the pet market, Espe especially for pet food, which of course we ingest or, 
our pets ingest, but also for, for non-foods. So again, parallel to the human market. Okay, thanks. And, and as a follow-up to that, there's another question that was kind of related. Uh, do you see, as far as the human consumption trends, do you see uh, the same trend regarding uh, organic uh, uh, foods also applying to the accessory market as well? Or like the Be, human because, Yeah. Right. The, because, you know, it is certainly strongest in food, but it does apply to other markets. For example, you, you, you definitely see it in the use of materials like hemp. For, for accessories and leases. So I, I do see it as a concern, and especially in terms of the product lines that are going to be growing and disproportionately appealing to millennials, I, they definitely will be looking for natural materials. Um, though, though maybe not to the degree, or at least to the extreme that you see in food. The, um, the, the other important distinction is that in food, of course, organic, as in the human market, has taken on um, there, there are all other sort of concerns that go along with it that can be local, that can be um, you know, locally sourced. Um, there are several other concerns that tie in along with organic. So it's not simply organic versus not. Great. Thanks. Uh, here's another one. Um, one of the attendees was wondering how the AFCO rulings will impact consumers' purchasing decisions. Uh, for example, not being able to make claims like made in the USA or all natural. Uh, and they were wondering if you have had the opportunity to forecast attitudes on that. We haven't really done that. And in general, our approach, we're looking at the consumer market, at the broader market, and at the food market, and looking at um, how the, the pet products market reflects that. So really, I, I can't say that I have information on how that regulatory angle will impact the market. But once again, the same, the same issue applies in the human market, including, for example, in current attempts for the government to define natural. Cool, cool. Okay, uh, regarding the internet sales, uh, what, what do you see as the growth rate for uh, internet sales? I think our, our and we, we uh, survey on this really all the time, I think in the last, it's certainly, of course, higher than, than retail. Um, in the last few years, it's been about 12%. I think for the most recent year, we estimate 15% growth. And that's against overall, for example, just for context, maybe 6% growth in the specialty pet channel and um, really pretty flat growth in the mass market for pet products. But the other thing, so there's no question that the Internet is, um, is booming as a retail channel. And don't forget also that home delivery of pet food and, and pet food is what anchors pet, um, pet product purchasing um, patterns to a large degree. A couple of comments. It does vary significantly by type of product. So, for example, we distinguish between pet food, pet medication, where online delivery has always been very strong, and other types of pet products. But increasingly with Amazon and with the delivery, um, sort of the home delivery wave, those, that, those distinctions are becoming less important. The other thing to keep in mind is that really at this point, internet, mobile, um, that's baked into retail sales. It's, it can also be a little bit artificial to talk about internet sales versus other sales. For example, with um, not the case with Amazon, but certainly with your pet superstores, of course, very active in um, in online buying. But even your your, your main um, your WalMarts, your Targets, your Costco, all very active. So really, increasingly, internet. And um, mobile ordering and shopping is simply baked into the into the into the um, purchasing decision and buying behavior more so than really a completely separate um, sort of bricks versus clicks type of debate. I, I would guess that uh, especially uh, free shipping services like Amazon Prime would make it more likely that consumers would leverage that to order some of the bulkier items so that they don't have to carry it from the store. Uh, are you seeing uh, any data that reflects that? You know, people ordering you know the the bulk dog food, so on and so forth, using these uh, services. Um, I, not, I don't think we personally don't have our own data, but that's definitely the case. You can see the high numbers for home delivery. Um, that really would not be the case if people were were paying for for delivery of those bulky items. 
Um, and it's, and it's, it's not just, say, free delivery through Amazon. Amazon, for example, also has, I can't remember what they call it, but it's like a box. You essentially buy a big carton. And whatever fits in that carton, you could deliver for four dollars, and so um, and it tells you as you sort of fill that carton how much space you have left. So basically, the the delivery charge for for bulky pet food was sort of the last obstacle to major use of online for pet product shopping, and essentially the obstacle is is no longer there. Um, Amazon has really broken down that barrier, and that will certainly be the norm for the future. Thanks. Okay, let's talk about cats. You mentioned early on in the presentation uh, that cats were, were not as popular, they're getting less popular than dogs as pets. Do you see the cat population uh, as likely to grow? If I said that cats were less popular than dogs with a live, with, with the audience in front of me, I, I would be mauled. Um, so the uh, <laughs> cats are holding their... Cats are holding their own as pets, as we saw, but but dogs are um, are, are really have the momentum and popularity, and so to give sort of a mixed answer, on the one hand, I think that cats are underappreciated in the U.S. as pets, and I think they're especially great pets for seniors who are becoming um, you know much more important as a continued part of the market, and of course, cats really make sense with the urban living and condo and small apartment trend. So in a lot of ways, cats have a lot going for them. And maybe the uptick that we saw in the Simmons data for 2015 is an omen of things to come. On the other hand, it's hard to compete with dogs, and especially with small dogs. And really the trend in dogs has been towards smaller dogs, which are more, you know, more, um, they work better with urban living, with apartment or condo living. And that's, that's tied in to their increasing popularity as pets. And so once the trend goes to small dogs, then the, um, your competition is more direct. The, um, so you know, we'll, we'll see. But cats are holding their own. But again, it's tough to compete with a puppy in terms of the overall marketplace. Thanks. Um, one of the unfortunate things uh, happening with the parallel of uh, human is, you know, with the humanization of pets, is that like Americans, pets are also getting the problem. They're living longer, so they're they're getting aging problems, and a lot of them are getting obese. So, what trends are you seeing there as far as products aimed at uh, aging pets and and fat pets, and you know, uh, pet health? There, there's definitely a significant percentage of products. The, you have both your senior and weight management products. A lot of pet food formulations are, um, are in that vein. But also you see a lot of attention to the usual health concerns of seniors. For example, mobility is important in pet supplements and even in pet treats. And we also have, for example, in pet bedding, a lot of orthopedic kind of mattresses, even in stuff like leashes and harnesses, a lot of special accommodations for um, aging pets and other type of sort of um, um, pets that have mobility challenges. So that's definitely a big part of the market. With, um, it has been a big part of the market with boomers pets, of course, especially, because our pets age with us. To a degree, though, with the millennials entry the market, your, your puppies and your kittens now are as important as a new segment because, of course, your, your younger pet owners your first-time pet owners um, will have the will t will tend to have the younger pets, but not necessarily if they adopt from a shelter, as is increasingly the um, um, the case. And you, you mentioned pet supplements. That that uh, was one thing that I was amazed to see um, at our pet planning sessions last month was the fact that there were so many supplements out there, and not only that, but so many supplement delivery forms. So you had either pills. You had uh, liquids, you had sprays, all different ways of delivering supplements. And, and the supplements, uh, they address a lot of the same things that we would address with ours, you know, for your uh, joints, for probiotics, calming. I mean, it's amazing that pets need to be calmed down now. So we're starting to see a lot of that at, uh, in the products at our shows as well. 
Uh, okay, I have another. We're getting close to the end here, but I do have uh, one other question for you, and that is uh, on the proteins, exotic proteins. Um, one area that humans are starting to get into are insect proteins. Have you seen that on the horizon for pets? It's actually here. You'll see uh, there are at least pet treats that use cricket powder, which is the main insect pro protein. So um, I definitely see that coming. And the really as a broader trend, um, a longer term trend with world population, we're going to have to turn more to, um, to alternative proteins, and especially um, plant proteins, maybe insect proteins for our protein needs as humans as well as pets. And so especially over the long term, I see that happening. And millennials, once again, are especially prone to be eating less meat, to be consciously seeking out alternative protein sources, and especially plant protein sources, um, and to be vegans, which of course would not work well with that cricket powder. But yes, I think that will be coming, and at least in terms of, um, um, at least at a, at a um, niche specialty level. It's already there, at least in pet treats. Great. Two more questions, then we got to wrap it up. Uh, the first one is, what percentage of pet specialty shoppers are switching to multi-outlet or vice versa? You know, I, I'm going to say all of them. The, um, uh, that's a little bit glib. Um, I don't have the data at my fingertips. We do, we do track that. But, but certainly multi-channel shopping is the norm. There's just no question. Um, unfortunately, I can't remember the, the, the exact stats, but especially when you factor in um, internet-only retailers like Amazon, the um, multi, multi-outlet shopping is, is the norm, and even really multi-channel. So people absolutely shop both in pet specialty, in the pet superstores, and in the mass market. They might buy cat litter here. They might buy their pet food somewhere else. They might buy their next um, you know, collar online. That, that really is the norm. And, the, and it's not even, even with, with the percentage of, of, of customers who are sort of channel loyal, even then it's, it's even channel loyal. It's not to, to a, single, a single retailer. So um, absolutely the norm will absolutely increase um, in the future. OK, final question. Uh, are millennials buying more toys for their pets because they're earlier in the pet ownership life cycle, like a novelty effect, or uh, is it perhaps due to them taking in younger pets? What's your thoughts on that? I would say both those. And off, off, just the gut instinct. I, again, I might be shot for this. Um, it seems to me that millennials had a lot more toys than I did when I was growing <laughs> up. So I think there's also just what you're used to. Again, we want for pets what we expect for ourselves. Um, so. Watch for digital toys for, for pets near you. OK, great. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Uh, if we didn't get to your question, uh, we'll be sure to answer it via email. So uh, on behalf of ECRM and Package Facts, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. Thanks to the Package Facts team for the amazing data. And uh, if you missed any portion of the presentation, you can go to packagefacts.com or ecrm.marketgate.com. And uh, we'll have links to the on-demand version. Uh, you'll also find several in-depth research studies on the pet market available at the Package Facts website. And uh, last but not least, don't forget, ECRM's pet planning session next year will be held April 24 to 27 in Oak Brook, Illinois. And for more information on that, you can go to ecrm.marketgate.com. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful afternoon.